soon after I was born, the Bible came into my life. This uh, little New Testament inside says Denny. In my own writing, which looks like I was about four or five when I decided to claim it as my own, it was presented to me, and then my parents gave it to me later when I, they thought I could appreciate it a little bit, and it has been in my possession ever since. Uh, for a few years, it was in the top drawer of the chest, and then I discovered it. And then I pulled it out, and about three or four times since then, I have rediscovered it in a drawer on a bookshelf. And on occasion, I picked it up and just held it and thought about the Bible has been part of my life pretty much all my days. What about you? Some of you and many Christian adults memorized the Bible verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. When I was a child, I thought like a child. I spoke like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became an adult, I put away childish things, childish practices. A wonderful verse of scripture. The sad part of that, though, is that some people think that reading and studying the Bible was a childish practice. And many Christian adults decided to put away Bible. In fact, there are some Christian adults who have turned so much more to reading science and history and fiction that they cannot name the four Gospels. Let's go ahead and name them now. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Good job. Now, your neighbors didn't know that. <laughs> many people, we put a little piece in this past week's Family News. There are many people that cannot name but about two or three of the disciples, the apostles. Some folks cannot name all kinds of pieces of common knowledge for some folks about Bible, but for other people, I just don't know what that is. It's always interesting when we start enlisting folks to teach children in Sunday school, when they'll say, oh, I couldn't do that, I just don't know enough Bible, as if three-year-olds or seven-year-olds are biblical scholars. <laughs> the Bible. We need a more mature view of the Bible. When the sanctuary was constructed in 1925 and dedicated in 1926, a stained glass window was placed into this building. It will not help you to look in this room to find it, for it is outside this room. This particular roundel, not of a crown or of lilies or cup and bread, this particular roundel is beyond the Holy Spirit dove window. It's just beyond here and it's over the stairs that go from this level up to the third floor where the education classrooms where young people and others would be studying scripture, where they'd be learning together. And it says, Holy Bible on the round bell, and there is a, a picture of a Bible. Eyes have been drawn to this Bible now for all of these decades. The textual markings, though, on that Bible are not Hebrew, they're not Greek, and they're not even English. Some people have even said they appear to be chicken scratch. Just little checks and X's and things. I like it. I think that's best. The more I've stood there on that landing or sat on those steps and tried to reflect on that window and why those chicken scratchings are there. What I like about the fact that the text is not, all right, I need to figure out which passage did he choose and why was the artist choosing that passage and what was the message they were trying to bring to us. It's a reminder to me when I look at those chicken scratch marks 
that the text of the Bible is always not supposed to focus on itself, but point beyond itself to the living Word of God. It's not about the words on the page. It's about the message alone. It's about the message that comes through those written words to you as the living Word of God challenges you and speaks to you and guides you and helps you think the ways and the thoughts of God. I would offer to you that the Bible has always been important to Baptists. Ever since our beginnings over 400 years ago in England, Baptists have wrestled with the Bible. In recent decades, Baptists have wrestled over the Bible more than we may have wrestled with it. There are some passages with which we still wrestle. But in recent decades, in some of us for our adult years, Baptists seemingly, at least in this nation, have divided themselves over into two camps, the fundamentalist Baptist and the liberal Baptist. And in between those two extremes, there are all kinds of other varieties of Baptists. Someone once asked me, how many different kinds of Baptists do you know exist in the world? And I said, how many Baptist people do you know? There are a lot of different kinds of Baptists, partly because of our principle called soul freedom. We'll speak to that again. But on these two extremes, the fundamentalist Baptist and the liberal Baptist, a word should be said. And I would offer to you that St. John's has embraced neither extreme throughout our history. We are neither the fundamentalist Bible perspective nor the liberal Baptist perspective, which may be a surprise to some. Fundamentalist Baptists have basically written that you interpret Jesus through the Bible. In other words, they have elevated the Bible to have authority over Jesus. They rewrote the Baptist faith and message in 1980, and again in the 1980s, and then again in the year 2000, trying to make sure everyone understood that you interpret Jesus through the Bible. That is not historically how Baptists have looked at the Bible. We interpret the Bible through Jesus, where the teachings and the ministry and the sense of understanding our understanding of Jesus seems to be at odds with a biblical passage or text. We have always chosen to side with Jesus rather than try to misconstrue or turn Jesus into some kind of weird yoga stance so that position so that Jesus would agree with a biblical passage. Fundamentalists have suggested that the Bible is without error in every way and is to be taken literally in all situations, circumstances, and subjects, which has caused fundamentalists to deny science and sidestep compassion quite often. They have often defended, defended a perspective of God which Jesus clearly refused and taught against. Often fundamentalist inerrantists have used the Bible as a weapon of hatred and exclusion. The late Dr. Fred Craddock, professor of preaching in the New Testament at Emory University, Canada Divinity School, offered in a sermon these words, if in reading the Bible you find justification for abusing, humiliating, disgracing, harming, or hurting, especially when it makes you feel better about yourself, then you're absolutely wrong. Now, at the other extreme, liberal Baptists have often embraced science and social progress to such an extreme that liberals have relegated the Bible to be a source outside of their life. Most liberals have nothing at all to do with the Bible, except maybe to quote it when they're trying to find something to talk about that the Bible may speak to. But in terms of the Bible having an influence in their life, reading it devotionally or spiritually, it's not something that most liberal Baptists have done. If you find, in fact, 
a liberal Baptist who has a tattered Bible because she or he is reading and studying and interpreting the Bible as inspired words so they can discern how God's Holy Spirit is speaking to them and challenging them to grow in the character of Jesus as his obedient disciple and learner. If you find a liberal Baptist with that kind of tattered Bible for that reason, you will have found a Baptist who belongs to an endangered species list. What we need is a biblical view of the Bible, a more mature view of the Bible. So I offer three snippets this morning. First, a biblical view of the Bible amplifies the human need for a relationship with God and obedience of God's ways. To amplify, of course, means to increase or to expand. The Bible expands our awareness as humans about our need for a relationship with God, about what other needs we have that are part of the will and the ways of God. The Bible extends to us more than just an invitation, but an encouragement to increase our understanding of how God's ways will save us from all kinds of trouble. In John chapter 5, which Paul read earlier, we find spiritual information in a story. But the Bible includes more than information. The Bible has the purpose of bringing information, but also for spiritual formation and also spiritual transformation. All of these are in this passage. In John 5, Jesus calls people to spiritual formation and reminds them the purpose of the scriptures is for spiritual transformation. See, the opponents of Jesus were not evil people. They were not mean people or irreligious people. They were God-fearing religious people who, according to Jesus, diligently studied the scriptures. But they were mistaken because, he says, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. You think that that's the main thing. They want Jesus to agree with their small concepts about religion and faith. They want Jesus to fit into their boxes. These people are enraged because Jesus' ministry and teachings do not agree with them. They want Jesus to be under Scripture. But it was Jesus who would quite often say, you have heard it said, because they didn't have written Bibles, they were hearing it addressed to them, and quite often what was being proposed to them as an idea that would be called scriptural was an interpretation that has nothing close to the text at all. Jesus said, you've heard it said, but I say it to you. Jesus places himself above scripture. A biblical view of the Bible amplifies the human need for a relationship with God and God's ways. The descendants of these people who confronted Jesus on this day are still with us. People who focus on a static relationship with doctrine or interpretations of scripture rather than on the written word of God. Do you notice what Jesus says recorded in verse 39? Jesus said, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have this life. In more contemporary language, what Jesus is saying is, you are so focused on and committed to a study of the scripture because you think you have a relationship with God through those words. These are the same words that are pointing to me. But you refuse to come to me to listen to my words because you're so overly focused on the words that are written. Did you hear about the young man who went off to college, leaving behind his fiancée? She wrote him every day. This sounds like Paul in my first year or two of college. 
she wrote him every day, and he wrote her now and then. But he loved her letters. He would read them and reread them. He would highlight words and circle words and phrases. He even got different colored magic markers and started indexing them. He created a little concordance and a thesaurus. And, oh, he created a little piece in the back that gave him some topics that he could go back. Now, you know, in 17 letters now, she has mentioned this phrase. I love that phrase. And he studied and studied and studied until it came time for a break from school and he wrote her a letter and said, I have enjoyed your letter so much I'm just not even going to come home. I'm just going to take this break and read your letter. I think there are a lot of people under the name of the Christian banner who live their lives today so focused on the Bible that they miss out on the relationship to which the Bible points them. That said, we must not ever err at the other extreme, failing to take the Bible seriously and allowing the Bible to not just be a childish practice, but to have a more, more mature relationship with God even through the Bible. Jesus' life and ministry focused on revealing God's truth, revealing God's character, revealing God's ways. And he helps us understand the importance of the Bible. He quoted it. He had parts of it memorized. Jesus would say to us by his own life example, the scriptures are important. A second way in which we need a more biblical view of the Bible is that a biblical view of the Bible affirms the historic principle that is a Baptist principle as well of Bible freedom. In other words, that the Bible focuses us on Jesus Christ. Do you know why Baptists do not recite creeds? Do you know why you will never be able to find anywhere written, this is what every Baptist believes? It's because of a principle that was there with Thomas Helmus and John Smith in the beginning called soul freedom. And that principle says that you and you and you and you are responsible and free to relate with God yourself. And because of that, God has created you to be free and responsible for a direct relationship with God. And God has entrusted to you the scriptures and all kinds of resources for you to use in that relationship, but no one else is in charge of your relationship with God. And you're responsible for how you walk with God. Well, that's a difficult challenge for many people. It always has been for some, but it's especially difficult in this day and time with self-appointed superstars for Jesus. Uh, several years ago, a young man that I knew moved into the city where I was serving at the time in order to be the pastor of the church. Now, when he and I went to coffee, and I said, tell me about this thing. He was not the pastor of the church. He was the local leader. And they would get together and have their music. And then all of a sudden, someone in another state would be piped in for the message. So I had this silly question. I asked my friend, you know, I think I've had a really good idea. Why don't all of us as ministers just stop interpreting scripture? And why don't we all just get big screens and just pipe in this one voice to all churches everywhere and let that one person be the interpreter? This church now has 17 locations throughout the southeastern state. And that one voice is the interpreter of the scripture. The Baptist principle of soul freedom says no to that practice. I asked my friend, so when did you stop being a Baptist? Oh, I'm still a Baptist. I said, no, you're not. I don't know what you are, but you're not a Baptist. He said, what do you think I am? I said, I think you're confused. The role of the 
scriptures, the role of the Holy Bible in Baptist polity and Baptist thought is that you're to use the Bible and make it a serious and authoritative guide in your life, but you don't worship it. But you're responsible to read it and to listen for the living word of God through the written word of God. Because you are free and responsible in your relationship with the living God. And beloved, if you do not embrace your freedom as a disciple, don't let me interpret the Bible for you. Interpret it for yourself. We may disagree with our interpretation. What we don't have freedom to do is to treat each other in ways that are not following the teachings of Jesus. But we can disagree with interpretation. We need to search for ways in which a mature, a biblical view of the Bible affirms us in being responsible before God. Now, a quick word. There's not a thing wrong with creeds. Not a thing wrong with creeds. But when someone says, well, in this creed is everything I believe, they are mistaken. Watch their living for just a little while. See if they're living according to that creed. That was never the purpose of the creeds. And we now have to make sure that we do not ever allow any written statement doctrine or belief to become the final authority they point to Jesus Christ. We are the missional people of God. We take our relationship with God as revealed in Christ to the world. We take God's message of compassion to the world. We do not merely take the message of the Bible to the world. And third and last, a biblical view of the Bible allows the written word of God to point beyond itself to the living word of God. When you allow the Bible to point beyond itself as Jesus is teaching to these people in John 5 in the story, you are allowing the Bible to be a resource for your journey of spiritual formation and spiritual transformation. The Bible is more than just a resource for spiritual information. For too many individuals and churches and traditions, the Bible is nothing more than that, information. Here are a few practical thoughts about you and the Bible. Let the Bible help you learn about the patterns of spiritual relationship. When you have a relationship with anyone that is healthy and growing, you have to give it time. You get to know the other person, the other person discloses himself to you, you disclose yourself to them, it takes time. I've read the Bible through in a year, I've read the Bible through in half a year, I've read the Bible through in four years, I've done all kinds of things like that, you probably have as well. But there's nothing wrong at all with taking a month just for one short passage and allowing yourself to go deeper and deeper and to recite and to reflect on that. Let the Bible show you the patterns and the language of spiritual relationship with God. Second, take your time. If you find yourself stopping when you're reading a passage and you say, I think there's nothing to be more here than what I'm getting out of this, go to some other resources and see what some biblical scholars and commentators and interpreters have said about that. Have you heard about this thing called Google? The internet. The wonderful thing about this is you have many resources to help you now interpret what is this passage said to other people? What did it mean it's an original context? What did this mean to that audience who read this first? What was that person's life like in that time? How did they first hear this message? All of those are good good questions. Just do not allow what it said to that person be the final word of what that living word of God says to you through that passage. Take your time. And third, as in all relationships, be fully present. Allow yourself to spend time with that biblical text. It's going to challenge you as well. 
A relationship that never challenges you is a shallow, hollow, empty relationship. Healthy and growing relationships encourage you to change. So when you read, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow. Ask, what does that mean for me? Not just what do those words mean, but what is that message that Jesus gave to me for me now? As you listen relationally through the Bible, and not just to the Bible, as you listen through the Bible, you will listen for messages that come to your life from the living word of the living God. You see, when you allow the Bible to be what God has intended for the Bible to become, those parts of yourself that are spiritually blind will begin to see glimpses of truth. The parts of yourself that are spiritually paralyzed will begin to move more freely. Those places deep inside of you where you have misunderstood or where you have felt oppressed or you've been treated as an outsider or unworthy, you will find the living word of God speaking words of hope and healing to you. The living word of God speaks to you through the written word of God. Beloved, let us renew ourselves through this window. Every time that you stop or think about it and drop by on Fifth Street, you notice the holy window, by, holy Bible window. You might just consider, I want to be one of those adults that putting away childish practices, childish ways, like avoiding the Bible. 